Well, hello. Thank you for coming to this talk. Uh, this talk is White Work, Understanding Whiteness and White Anti-Racist Identity. And so just a little disclaimer, um, we're going to be talking a whole lot about white people. White people as a group of people. And the last time I gave a talk about white people as a group of people, it was at a church. And a guy stood up at the church, right in the middle of my talk, and he said, you're a liar. Oh, so, so I'm ready for that. <laughs> so if any of you, I'm just going to throw this out here as a starter. It is quite possible that somebody in here is going to feel challenged. And if that happens, I am going to ask, because I'm a therapist, and I'm used to people feeling a little challenged and feeling emotions. We're going to talk about emotions. That if you feel some emotions, that maybe one of the ways I would suggest that you handle those emotions, my preference would be that you do not stand up in the middle of my talk and scream at me, you're a liar. You are the most racist person I've ever met in my life. That might throw me a little. But if you do that, I'm going to probably keep going. Because <laughs> we've got an hour and a half together. And my guess is that by the end of this, we might learn some things together. And I'll be here afterwards, and you can ask me some questions. We can talk about things. So we're going to talk about white people. I am also a white person. My name is Eric. My last name is Nykamp. I'm a Dutch guy. There's a lot of people at Calvin who are also white Dutch people. I'm also a man. I'm a straight white man. Where I work, I am the straightest, oldest white man that is there. Because I work at a black-owned private practice. And I'm really used to talking about this. And it is OK. So we're going to talk about a model. So do you know that people study white people? There are people who cut their academic teeth studying how white people do things. Sociologists, psychologists, they studied white people as a group. Because there's a whole lot of us around, in case you didn't notice. And they developed theories about the way we do things. Because you know what? We're pretty predictable. We are very predictable. And so we're going to talk about some predictable things that white people do. So here's what we're going to cover today. We're going to understand a model of white racial identity development. Then we're going to look at the difference between an individual response to racism and a systemic response. And I'm going to ask you, as you're listening to this model, to try to assess where each of you are in your own anti-racism development as individual white people. Because I'm going to be talking especially to white people. Now, I know there's a lot of people in this room. I'm going to direct this talk to white people. And anybody is welcome to listen in. In fact, there are some handouts in the back. So if you are not a white person, there are some models. Jazz, would you mind grabbing those handouts a second? So on these handouts, there are models of racial identity development for all different groups of people, not just the one. We're going to focus on the one for white people, because there's a lot of white people in the world. But there's models for all different groups of people. And on the handouts, show some of these models. And you might be able to find where things are similar, where things are different. We're also going to look at how systems, so systems basically are groups of people. And where might systems be developmentally? So here's the question I'm going to ask. And I'm going to ask all of you to be curious about this. So put your curious hat on. If an institution or an organization or a system is made up of a certain population of people who are developmentally at the same place, what is their response to racism? And the question I'm really curious about is, what are the white people like in that organization? 
Because let's just imagine that you're in an organization where there's a lot of white people. So developmentally, if white people in that organization are at a certain developmental phase in their understanding of racism, how might that impact the organization's response to racism? So that's my question. I want you to be curious about that because we're gonna look at what might happen. And the other thing I'm gonna, I'm gonna ask you to wonder about is whether this model makes sense for today. Because here is when this model was developed. This model was developed when I was in college by Dr. Janet Helms. She's a research psychologist. She's really well known for this. So she was studying white people who were your age back when I was your age, to be honest. So this is pre-Obama, pre-Trump, pre-before the word anti-racist was a word. When I was in college, the word that we had closest for this was multiculturalism. Maybe you would have people talk about celebrating diversity. It was about the closest we would get to being able to talk about racism. And people talk about racism, but it was really in this idea about that, like we're trying to celebrate what's important about different cultural groups. So she's doing her research during this time and she studied white people. And she said, I can take white people and put them in six different buckets. Six buckets based on whether they are at a beginner level all the way up to what we could say is like an expert level in understanding racism in the United States and what they want to do about it. And I'm wondering if you think it still makes sense today. Because now, it's a way different world. So I want to see if you think it still makes sense. So here's our model. The language has changed a little bit. And you'll see different, so if you Google her model, depending on when the graphic was made, the language will be a little different. Because the language has changed. We've, we use different words now than when she wrote it. But there's six stages. Here's the six stages of Janet Helms' white racial identity development model. The first slide, so I'm gonna show a series of slides now for each of these six stages. The first slide of each stage is a summary by Janet Helms. Second slide on each stage is gonna be a summary from Beverly Daniel Tatum and Allie Michael from their handout, Teaching While White. The discussion questions then are mine. And I'm gonna have discussion questions for individuals and for institutions. Now, I'm gonna read these questions rather fast. I'm really sorry about that. Here is what I want you to imagine when I'm reading these questions. I want you to imagine that the first set of questions for individuals are if I was leading you in a small group, because that's how you'd wanna do this. You would wanna have a small group experience with a group of white people who are saying, you know what, I wanna grow. And these are questions that I would wanna talk through and think about slowly with a group of white people that wanna work on this. And these are the kind of questions that we would ask at each of these developmental stages. Move myself from one stage to the next stage. And I'd probably find that I'd have some resistance at a certain stage. And that would be some questions, some hard questions I'd need to ask myself when I'm doing my work. The second set of questions will be systemic questions. And these would be the kind of questions that you'd ask a leadership team who's working at an organization or an institution to say, okay, you want to be an anti-racist organization. Let's do better than just have the diversity photo that you put on your website. Hmm? How about that? Let's talk about what it actually takes to retain people and make it 
be a workplace where you, people can thrive. Let's do that. Questions for leadership teams. So we're going to go through those. Here's stage one. Let's go. All right, we're going to do contact. In this stage, first stage contact, the individual adheres to what's called a colorblind model. You've probably seen people like this. Maybe you are a person like this. Talk about being colorblind. We talk about it like it's a good thing. We white people, we talk about that, right? We are colorblind people. See racial difference, but don't find it salient, and in fact, may feel that racism is in fact propagated by the discussion and acknowledgement of race as an issue. In this stage, there's no conscious demonstration of racism here. The seemingly non-racist position can cover unconscious racist, racist beliefs. If the individual is confronted with real world experience of, or knowledge that uncovers the privilege of white skin, they may move into the disintegration stage. So the big idea here is I'm colorblind and that's a good thing. And you'll hear people say that over and over and over. Here's another way to express the color, the contact stage. So people in this stage are unaware of their own racial identity. They don't think of themselves as white, but they think of themselves as normal. See how the, the language changes? People in this stage tend to view racism as individual acts of meanness rather than as an institutionalized system and typically don't recognize or acknowledge white privilege. In fact, they might get kind of upset. They might have naive curiosity or fear of people of color, usually based on stereotypes. People at this stage generally believe that the world is fair and everyone has equal opportunities. White folks in this stage are very unaware of their own whiteness and believe that this is a universal way of being that everyone should ascribe to. They don't even try to see race. They might really talk a lot about being colorblind. When they get messages of internalized superiority, these go unchallenged. Okay. I notice it's getting very quiet all of a sudden. So the therapist in me, when I see people getting quiet, I think a couple different things. So one of them is like, oh, people are thinking. People are thinking deeply. But I don't know unless they're saying something back. So I'm just curious, what are you thinking? What are you thinking as I'm reading these words? Yeah. I mean, I'm thinking this fits an organization or two that I know of. Mm. Seeing, seeing a lot that tracks it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So last week, Michael Jr., the comic, came to campus. He is one of my favorite thinkers about racism. And he has this joke where he says, people come up to me at my church and they say, I just want you to know that I don't see color. He's a very tall, large black man, in case you don't know who Michael Jr. is. And then he always says, I wonder why they decided to tell me that. And I bet a lot of people of color experience that. Like, I wonder why people keep telling me the same thing over and over and over. That's a really good example of the contact stage. So let's talk a little bit more about what people say, what white people say in the contact stage. So. Let's talk statistics for a moment. So statistically, most white people say they believe, so this is what we do as white folks. We say we believe that we wanna live in a multi-ethnic space, but we choose to live in segregated space. So let's look at where we choose to live because that's a really easy thing to do, right? We can count that. So white families are increasingly self-segregating. This is stats from right now. So. Here's what we do. The new form of segregation is voluntary. That white people are doing what we're doing as a group is that we're moving to what's called exurbs, exurbs, 
gated communities, unincorporated housing developments, and the countryside. This is why the only communities in the United States that have seen significant white growth are places that were already predominantly white. So we're the only ethnic group in the United States that lies to ourselves, statistically speaking. Whoa, my, my cable went out. Hmm. Okay, Satan. <laughs> here we go. Okay, so you can see the stats here. So what white people say we want, we actually say that where we would like to live is a place where we're slightly in the numerical minority. We say we would like to live in a place that's 46% white. Okay, Black folks, by contrast, say they would like to live in a place that's 37% black. Latino folks say they'd like to live in a place that's 32% Latino. Okay, now let's look at where we look, where we look to find housing. White people actually look for a place to find housing in a place that's 68% white. Black folks tend to look in a place that's 40% black. That's pretty close, right? 37 to 40%, it's not bad. It's pretty close. Latino folks look at a place that's exactly 32% Latino. Right on the nose. That's pretty good. Where do people choose to live? White folks. We choose to pick a place that's even whiter than the place that we're searching. Like within the places that we're looking to live, we pick the whiter ones. Black folks, by contrast, end up living in communities that are blacker. And Latino folks end up living in communities that are more Latino. But white folks, we're searching to start with in communities that are demographically extremely different from what we say we want. And that is different because we're lying to ourselves. As a group, our group characteristic is that we lie to ourselves. And that's just a statistic. Ooh, and it's not playing. Well, okay. So here's a joke from Chris Rock where he basically says like, this is, this is in the, the Obama years, where he says something like, hey, all of my black friends are starting to make white friends and all of my white friends have one black friend. <laughs> so let's look at that. Let's look at friendships. White people statistically only know other white people. And that informs what we think is normal. So we just looked at where we as white folks live. We tend to live in super white places. So guess who we're getting to know, right? So there's a place, PRRI. They have data shows that 75% of whites have entirely white social networks without any minority presence. Let's look at the stats. The average white American has 91 white friends, one black friend, one Latino friend, one Asian friend, one mixed race friend, one other race friend, and three friends that they don't really know. Can't really tell. It's their guess, which is kind of funny means they didn't ask, right? Or maybe they didn't feel comfortable asking. Okay, okay, but sometimes that happens, right? I guess if you had 100 friends, maybe you just didn't get around to it. I don't know if any of us have like 100 friends that we know that well that we're asking about those things, but it's just, it's an interesting stat, right? Okay, compare that to, to black folks. Black folks know 83 other black folks. They have eight white friends. That's really different. Okay, think about your top 10 closest friends. Okay, let's talk top 10. Let's pick friends that would call you their friend. Okay, so let's not do like the skewing that happens in these sort of things where we're like, wow, okay, we're talking about diversity here. So like, oh, who, are the, who are the people I know? You know, like, like a quick try to count people of color friends that like I might sort of know, but like, like, let's talk about, would they choose you back? Like, are they doing the same thing right now where they're like, oh yeah, then there's, you know, okay. 
so, so these are the statistics. Like we as white folks, we don't know many people. That's a deficit. We have a learning deficit. We have a relationship deficit. So think about how that prepares us as adults. We don't know stuff. So here's the discussion questions for the first stage. And let's call it what it is. Let's not pretend. Did I grow up in segregated space? Let's not talk about was it legally segregated? Was it demographically segregated? Who cares why? Did I grow up in segregated space or multi-ethnic space? And here's this is a very important phrase. Did I call my space my did I call where I grew up safe? This is a very important word. My friend John Williams, who works for the Fellowship Center for Racial Reconciliation, says that white people in general, there are three words that we like to focus in on about our identity. One of them is safety. Safety is a word that we use over and over and over. White people like to be safe. And what we consider safe isn't always about actual safety. We'll see how that shows up. We also like to think of ourselves as redeemers and as being innocent. So did we think of where we grew up as safe? From what or whom? What are the diversity characteristics of my 10 closest friends? People that would choose me back as their friend. What explicit, spoken, observable, or implicit, only observable, only by what's left out or not spoken about messages did I learn about race? Who did we have over for dinner? Who did we watch on TV? Who did we never have contact with? What are the implicit and explicit messages? When have I adopted a colorblind or all blood is red mindset to deny the discomfort of thinking about racial inequality? Or systemic questions. If my agency or institution has a colorblind approach to delivering services, what information could it be overlooking? What surveys is it not collecting? What, what data is it not seeking out to remain blind? By not asking questions about inequality, what effects could this have on perpetuating inequality? Well, most institutions that are colorblind would say, well, we're not perpetuating inequality. So here's how I would define inequality, the status quo. The status quo is unequal. So if we are perpetuating the status quo, that is perpetuating inequality. So if we're perpetuating the status quo, we can swap that out. If I'm doing what's normal, what's the least amount of effort, that is perpetuating inequality. All right, we did stage one. Everybody feeling comfortable? Because that's what we like as white people. We like being comfortable. <laughs> OK, there you go. We're going to go into the next page, disintegration. Probably some people are feeling disintegration right now. Uh, this talk could make people go right to disintegration, let's be honest. OK, in this stage, because the person has new experiences which confront their prior conception of the world, and because this conception is now challenged by this new information or experience, the person is often plagued, here we come, by feelings of guilt and shame. That happens in these kind of talks. I'm, I wish there was a way to do this without bringing those up. As a therapist, I don't want people to be stuck in guilt and shame. Sometimes these are the birthplaces of growth. 
because when we're uncomfortable, sometimes we decide to change so that we don't stay there. And that's a good thing. Sometimes we decide, I am sick and tired of feeling like this. And I'm going to do something about that. That's what I hope people do. There's also another way you can go. We'll get to that in a second. These emotions of guilt and shame can be modified when the person decides to channel these emotions in a positive way. But when those emotions continue to dominate, the person may move into the reintegration stage. Okay, another way to describe it, a little less heady. Awareness of racism and white privilege increase as a result of personal experiences. Common emotional responses to this new information include shame, guilt, denial, anger, depression, and withdrawal. Okay, all the major mental health conditions start showing up in here. Okay, whatever is kind of the way that any human being on the planet responds to distress, start showing up in here. When we feel stress, human beings go in these directions. Okay, sometimes people in this stage might attempt to persuade other people to abandon racist thinking. People might, white folks might, have a conscious but conflicted acknowledgement of whiteness. It's not usually real worked out yet, but there's some stuff. It's sort of like this, like the light on the dashboard is flickering on and off, okay? People might feel like they're caught between racial realities. So if we were in a small group and talking about this stuff, Here's some of the stuff that we talk about. So if we were in small group, we'd spend a lot of time in this stage talking about feelings. Because what can happen if we don't talk about our feelings, let's talk about what happens when we don't talk about feelings, okay? You don't talk about feelings, you still have feelings, right? Your body's gonna feel the feelings. And let me tell you, probably all of you know somebody that feels feelings and they say they don't feel feelings, right? Like you ask them, like, how are you doing? Fine! Why are you asking? <laughs> hmm. All right. <laughs> and then everybody's kind of, you kind of hope everybody else in the room is like, read their own, people. Jerry is having a bad day. <clears throat> don't ask Jerry why you're wearing his sweatshirt. Why he's wearing your sweatshirt. Let that go. Just let that go. Let Jerry just have a minute to like collect himself. Like, right? You just kind of hope everybody's picking up on that because Jerry thinks he's fine, but he looks like he's about to rip somebody's head off. And that's not cool. So that's what happens when people feel feelings but can't acknowledge their feelings. It's that everybody feels like they need to duck and run. Okay, so that can happen to any one of us good people. When we feel feelings, but don't acknowledge our feelings, is that we can become the grenade in the room that everybody just wants to run from. Now let's imagine it on the systemic level. <laughs> Ugly, right? Okay. That's what happens when we don't know how to handle our feelings. It gets really scary really fast. So if we were in a small group, we would talk about what feelings are we having? We'd get really good at identifying the emotions, what that feels like in our body, what is the emotion label that we would use to describe that, and how do we get safe with each other in the room talking about what those words are and talking about it and just getting used to talking about it out loud. That would take months. Okay, so as I'm going through this presentation, we are not just kind of imagining that, like, we just clip right through, right along through this. Okay, so I'm, this is slow work. Optimally would be months, right? Okay, so how do you respond to your own emotions of shame, guilt, denial, anger, depression, or the desire to withdraw when you are the best version of yourself? How do you respond to these emotions when you're the most wounded version of yourself? Oh, yeah. We're sometimes those people too, right? 
what's the worst version of ourselves? What, what about when we're Jerry's? <laughs> we kind of want to imagine that we're the person that tells everybody, don't ask Jerry about why he's wearing your sweatshirt. We want to be that person. We don't want to be Jerry, but sometimes we're Jerry. And we all know that we're like Jerry sometimes. So then we'd spend a few months at least talking about them, getting comfortable recognizing our worst version of ourselves. Then we get to the third one. When it comes to conversations about race, what are times when you've been wounded, when you've been a wounded version of yourself? And as white folks, we need to talk about that. That all of us have been awful at different times talking about this because we have, including me. And what can we learn about our reaction habits as we grow as white people? To just get really honest about that. So now we're kind of imagining a system with white folks at this level of change, okay? What would a system be like? People working on themselves like this. How does my agency or institution respond emotionally to information about its track record of service delivery to people of color? What if you worked for a place that actually asked that? Like, for real, for real. Not in the defensive way. Not, I need to hear a good story about myself as an agency. Make me, make me be the hero. Tell me about when I sucked. Or if you're a church. Tell me about the people I hurt. This question, how does my agency do with attracting and hiring people of color? Are there equitable pay rates and transparency about this? Here's a way to measure it. Do people of color have the same length of tenure at your agency? Or do we just pick them up and put them down? Oh, we can replace that person. We just need faces for a photo, right? We need our, we need our person of color stamp of approval person. We can replace them. What's the comfort level institutionally in talking about these very real issues? I would ask the institution those questions. All right, let's go to number three, reintegration. This stage is marked by a blame the victim attitude that's more intense than anything experienced in the contact stage. So the way that the reason they're calling it reintegration is because this is a return to racism. Okay? So what we're kind of assuming here is that the person is experiencing emotions, but they're not digesting them. They're suppressing them. That is the assumption. Okay? They may feel that although whites do have privilege, it's probably because they deserve them and are in some way superior to minority groups. If the person can combat these feelings, they may be able to move on to the pseudo-independent stage. Another way to put it, they might feel pressured by others to not notice racism. Feelings of guilt and denial are transformed into fear and anger towards people of color. Common responses are to blame the victim. And that, if you can remember that phrase, that is the, the hallmark characteristic of this stage. Stage three, blame the victim. So white folks in this phase choose to avoid the issue of racism if possible, rather than struggling to define a non-racist identity. Guilt and anxiety transformed into hostility and anger. 
feels like there's no right answers to being, and that being white is to be wrong. There's selective attention to stereotypes confirming information about people of color. And percentage-wise, many white people live in the reintegration stage because the disintegration stage is the most painful and difficult to navigate. For many white folks, 2020 was disintegration and 2021 was reintegration. And as a nation, I would say we are in reintegration right now. And I'm seeing some head nods. <laughs> So the therapist in me is like, oh, let's look at why this is. Why do we get stuck here, right? Why do we get stuck with certain emotions? Why do we do that? Why do we do that? We know that's not good for us, but why do we do it? What is it about anger that makes us want to just churn that stuff around? And we just do it. We just milk it like it's... Like, whoa, what are we doing? What are we doing? Okay, what's underneath this? Okay, so I'm gonna go into teacher mode for a minute. Anger is what we therapists love talking about as a secondary emotion. Okay, so what that means is that it is triggered by another emotion. So whenever someone's angry, we ask the question, what's underneath it? The theory says there is another emotion that we experience, maybe for a long time, maybe for a hot second, that happens before we feel anger. And the anger is a way, in some ways, to say, I don't like this other emotion. I'm going to feel anger to push back against it. And we can feel anger against ourselves. We can feel anger against somebody else, another thing, and anger against an idea. But it is a, it is like an emotional push. And what's underneath the anger? Here is a diagram to help you. So if you were in my therapy office, we would pull out this little diagram. And we'd say, I am curious. That is a question I asked you when you started this. I am curious. What is underneath the anger? Here is a helpful guide. So look at all the different emotions that it could be. It's the emotions from the stage before, right? So let's notice how the reintegration stage is anger at people who point out the effects of racism rather than anger at racism itself. This may be because there is a beginning recognition that as white folks, we can uphold racism by sustaining the status quo. And this is an uncomfortable thought. So we can get mad at the messenger, and that allows us to sidestep doing the work of actually addressing the source of the problem. I'm going to get mad at anybody that tells me about the problem instead of getting mad about the problem. See how that goes? I'm going to get mad. We'll pick a separate thing. I'm going to get mad at people that tell me about deforestation instead of being mad about deforestation. See the difference? Mm. Yeah. So here's the thing. In our culture in the United States, anger for whatever reason, is the emotion that men, characteristically, are kind of like conditioned to express in our culture. That's like the most accepted emotion for men to express when we are feeling discomfort. And it's not exclusively. I tend to be a guy who cries. I get teased at work about this. So in our staff meetings, my, my female boss and I will look at each other across the, t the table and we'll, kind of, we'll say, it's going to be you or me. <laughs> Who's going to cry first? 
and now we hired a third person, and then we're like, it's going to be one of the three of us. <laughs> Who's going to cry at the staff meeting first? And okay, so I'll, I'll defy stereotype on that one. But as, as a group, it tends to be men. We men tend to yell. What about tears? Let's talk about tears. That's the other one. How do tears function? What about it? In the reintegration stage. How, how do tears function? So some researchers are now asking us to think about how, in this case, white women's tears function similarly in conversations about race. How does it, how do tears function to keep us from talking about the problem? In, and so, you know, white tears, I'm not going to belabor this, but white tears can sometimes take the focus off helping those hurt by racism and refocus energy on helping white people who are experiencing discomfort, learning about the experiences of other people who are harmed by racism. See how that's a dodge? So, sort of like if you're driving past a car accident, and there's people who are hurt in the car. And if instead we decided to help people who are driving by, who are upset by seeing a car accident, that doesn't make sense, does it? We'd never do that. But when, we, when I do anti-racism ed, it would not be uncommon when somebody if a person of color says, like, they tell a story about something that was really upsetting that happened, say, like, a run-in with the police, and a white person starts crying, and the group focuses all their attention on the crying white person about, like, how upset they are, and a group of people huddle around and, like, oh, we need to, like, maybe the whole group would stop, and, like, maybe we need to pray for you. And sometimes... The way this will talk about get talked about is I don't feel safe. I'm feeling uncomfortable gets expressed as I don't feel safe. So I mean I, I'm not gonna hammer this too hard. But let's ask the question, white folks. When do we talk about our discomfort as safety? And is it really safety? Is it really safety? Like are, we, are we physically unsafe, really? Let's think about the history of laws in the United States developed around the idea of white safety and how those were enforced and who enforces those laws and how those laws are interpreted by what groups of people, what majorities of people. and how we as white folks kind of understand that this idea of safety is understood by white people systemically in our society and that that is unfair. It's just unfair. And we don't even have to think about it. It just happens unless we do something about it. People die for this stuff. Whole communities were executed. And if you don't know the stories, got to learn the stories. Because that stuff's deep. Tears hijack these conversations. Systemically, institutions <clears throat> might decide that these conversations are just too upsetting to have. Oh my goodness. We can't talk about this because Look, our staff are crying, and by staff, we mean the white people. 
We're not talking about the people of color. We're talking about, we're talking about staff, which when we don't talk about people by their racial identifiers, we're meaning the white people, because that's what we do. Okay, so, and that leaves a racially harmful status quo in place. So here's the discussion questions. What do you do when you get angry, cry, or feel guilty? Especially when you handle these emotions poorly. And that's, that's kind of the question that we would do in a small group. Like, what do we do? Okay. Especially knowing maybe like what the consequences are racially in our country when we handle our emotions in certain ways. How might this response manifest itself in discussions about race? If you have an example, so this would be another small group question. If you have an example from the present or the past, feel free to share. How did you learn from when you expressed yourself in ways that you wish you hadn't? So this would be when that safety of the group was really important. There would have to be a lot of trust, right? For people to be able to disclose, this is when I totally blew it. Like people, like I totally came unglued. This is, I totally blew it. Imagine like the level of shame that you'd kind of feel and then to disclose that to a group and have that handled well. That would be what you'd do in a small group like this. Or a systemic question. So right here I'm imagining, because I'm going to be doing this shortly, going to a mental health agency, for example. So let's look at the way that we write about people. What are the ways that your clinical documentation is done about people of color? Well, what about like blaming the victim language, how this shows up in people's medical records? Because that happens. So these are questions that I'll be asking a group of social workers in, across the state of Michigan in three weeks. Because I'm doing this talk there. How do these words show up in people's charting? And what do you mean by these words? Because we like to say we're not biased, but let's be real. Every human being's biased. We're all biased. When we say we're not biased, that's stage one. That's colorblind stuff, right? Like, that's not even on the, it's kind of like not even being on the scale. So let's look at that. How do we, how do, we do that? If we, so let's imagine you're working for a church. How do we talk about the people that go to the deacons? Who are the people you ask to be on the deacons? How do you, who do you ask to be on the elder board? Who do you ask to be your pastor? Let's turn the corner. Pseudo independence. Okay. So in Janet Helms' model, so remember, she's studying white people, a lot of them to choose from. She's, this is where she says, okay, there's this, there's this shift. So on all her, her diagrams, you can look at the way that she writes this out. She actually draws this big arrow, like where there's this movement. Okay. She calls this the first stage of positive racial identification. So she says that there's movement for white folks that move from the earlier stage to this stage. This is the first stage of positive racial identification. She says, although an individual in this stage does not feel that whites deserve privilege, they look to people of color and not themselves to confront and uncover racism. Maybe if you're a person of color in the room, maybe you know some white folks like this. They might be asking a lot of questions. Maybe if you're a white person in the room, maybe you're doing that right now. Maybe you're asking some people of color friends, maybe profs or other folks, you know, so a lot of questions right now. You have a lot of questions. So white folks in this stage approve of these efforts and confront, <laughs> oh, people of color approve of these efforts and confront the person at, this, 
at these efforts and validate this person's desire to be non-racist. So you, you know, as a white folk, as a white person, you're getting some props for this. But at this stage, people, white folks are, are not sure how to be white and non-racist or anti-racist. A little confusing. Still kind of in the learner phase, but committed to the journey. Okay, so that's kind of the difference here. Lots of questions committed to learning. Here's another way of expressing the same phase. Okay, so individuals in this stage have abandoned their belief in white superiority. They have an intellectual understanding of the unfairness of white privilege and recognize that they have personal responsibility for dismantling racism. It's very intellectualized. They might choose to distance themselves from other white people and actively seek out people of color to help them better understand racism. They're doing a lot of thinking about racial issues rather than feeling. They're really leaning on people of color to define racial identity, racial issues. They see racism, but may still believe that if people of color worked harder, racism wouldn't affect them as much. I think that's a really interesting observation that Janet Helms made right here. It feels like a little bit of a carryover from an earlier stage, and she observed that this is still showing up here. But she says, okay, white folks at this stage still compare oppression like my people suffered too, and continues to ex exhibit a sense of internalized superiority. So, the, so there's some mix. So here would be some discussion questions that we'd talk about at this stage. When is it more comfortable for me to talk about racism intellectually than to talk about my emotions that come up when I talk about racism? So here would be kind of like the example, like, so am I more comfortable talking about racism in the news? Am I more comfortable talking about theories or things that I'm learning about in class than my emotions or my mistakes or where I feel conflicted, like the vulnerable stuff. It's that kind of stuff. Here's another one. When do I want people of color to share their stories of racial pain with me or teach me about racism rather than learning what I can on my own or signing up for a class? Like, when is my go-to? I've got Google. I could look on YouTube. I wonder what I could find out on my own. I wonder how many times my friend of color gets asked about this. I wonder if them telling this story is painful for them. Or this question. When do I get distracted by ideas about racism? Like, if people of color worked harder, racism wouldn't affect them. Or my people suffered too. How did these ideas function to keep me from developing empathy for people of color generally? Sometimes I'll watch that in workshops or, or talks where somebody will, this is a pretty predictable one, somebody will raise their hand, they're like, did you know that Irish people, can you, can, do you know this one? <laughs> okay. <laughs> Irish people weren't white when they first came over. Actually, I do know. Like, in fact, you know, sometimes I'll, over, I'll overcompensate by bringing a large stack of books to demonstrate emphatically that, like, in fact, I have read a great deal, and this is one shelf, you know. But, like, in fact, that is, that is why I'm an anti-racism educator, is that, in fact, I, I have read and learned a great deal about this topic, which is why I'm talking about it. But, like, you know, but I'm really glad that you read a book about that. That's that's very helpful. I hope you continue reading these books. Yeah. And and so, you know, somebody will say something like that. And 
it, I'm just I'm being glib. Once in a while, somebody does say something I don't know, which is absolutely true. But but those kind of statements that like you know, did you know that white people had it hard too? Well, yes, I, I do. White people did in fact have it have it hard. Um, they also weren't chattel slaves, you know, which is something, and um, you know they weren't. There wasn't like genocide and stuff, so there's that, and just weren't forced to learn a new language, and you know, in general, not like raped and things. So, but yeah, they it was rough, bad working conditions, and you had to eat bad food, so. <laughs> And, and it's a way to kind of deflect, right? To not have to empathize. To say like, look, you know, if I can tell myself a story that somehow there's something about my folks that they could do it, then I don't have to feel so bad for you. That's a way to psychologically distance. And that's not really helpful, is it? Hard to see somebody's humanity when what you're doing inside is to tell yourself a story that somehow you're better. I mean, no one wants to say that's what you're doing, but that's what you're doing. And that's kind of damaging. No one wants to say, hey, I'm telling myself a story that I'm superior. It's white supremacy. That's, that's kind of what it is. It's pretty much exactly what it is. That's what it is. So systemically, who's responsible for addressing issues of racial inequality at your workplace? Who historically has done it and how much institutional power did they have? Who would be the best positioned to do it within your agency? So is it people of color's responsibility to talk about racial inequality at your place of employment? Whose job is it? Who's positioned best to be able to leverage those conversations without blowback, without having their neck out too far and getting axed, to be quite blunt? How different is it to make the argument from the bottom than from the top? Hmm, how about that? What would help your staff develop more empathy and comfortability in talking about racial issues? Or if we're talking in a, in a group to do team development, to become an anti-racist workplace, are you familiar with best practices for agencies in becoming better able to talk about race and inequality? If you're not familiar, how would you find out what those best practices are? Because they're out there. There are people that wrote books on it. In fact, one of them actually is Matt Calvin. Like they literally wrote a manual. It's a literal manual. Like you can talk to the person that wrote the book on that. And, and there's the books, right? So. How do you find the resources? Because if you just are assuming that like, hey, one time I asked, you know, let's just say, I'm a powerful CEO and I found some people who are, you know, several tiers below me who are people of color and I got them together in a room and I said, hey, does our company workplace have a problem with race? And they all said, uh, no. So I walked away and I said, yeah, there's no problems here. <laughs> Because I asked, let's talk about power differential. <laughs> let's talk about, hey, I wanted to keep my job. OK, next stage, immersion, immersion. In this stage, the person makes a genuine attempt to connect to his or her white identity to be anti-racist. So this is stage five. There's one more after this. This stage is usually accompanied by deep concern with understanding and connecting to other white people 
who've been dealing with issues of racism. This sounds really different, right? These are folks who, okay, so the last stage, white folks asking people of color, teach me about racism. I know I've got a problem, I need you to teach me about it. Now we've got white people looking for other white people who want to work on racism. How do I find other white people who are also working on being anti-racist and working with them? Who are my other anti-racist white people? Hmm, I need to work with them. We need to work together. We need to figure out who we are and encourage one another. We need to be one another's anti-racist white people. It's stage five. In some ways, this is like learning how to walk on your own. To say as a white person that I can be an anti-racist white person without needing people of color to lean on. I can do it myself. Doesn't mean I can't have friends. Doesn't mean I don't need their encouragement or their love or their support. But I can know that they've got my back without them having to do more work than I'm doing. They aren't propping me up. In some ways, it's like, okay. Up until this stage, people have been pouring into you. And now you're like, I've been invested in. It's time for me to pay back. Or if we want to use, let's use Christian language, okay? It's like you've been discipled. And now you're going to go out and you're going to... It's like Jesus sent the disciples out two by two, okay? Now you're going out. And you're going out with other people that you're both disciples. You go out and you're going to go do the work. And it's hard work. It's not easy work. My guess is when Janet Helms studying this stuff, like I always kind of imagine, she didn't draw it as a pyramid, but I kind of feel like it's a pyramid. We're like, we're getting up. Like there's a whole lot of people who are colorblind. There's a whole lot of people that are like, oh my gosh, I got all these feelings. And there's a whole lot of people that are reacting. And it's like, you can't make me feel bad. And then I feel like it all of a sudden narrows. I feel like we're getting at this like kind of thin space, but it's a really good space. So there's these people here, they're, they're actively seeking to redefine whiteness. And they're asking self questions, like who am I racially? What does it really mean to be white in the United States? These are folks that need support from other anti-racist white people. Notice that there's this identity shift, okay? They know they're white. And they're also adding this other piece, anti-racist white. And they know who they are. Anti-racist white people who are asking similar questions, and that's how they know. They know they haven't arrived, but they know they're asking questions. And that's the characteristic. So they're focusing on developing a positive white identity, not based on assumed superiority. It's humility. It's humility. I took this off, of, off another sheet. I don't know if it's even taking pride but I think that they're, that they're starting to identify 
is being actively anti-racist. Maybe they're taking pride in it. I kind of want to think it's humbly identifying as it. They're taking more responsible for racism and privilege. I think in this day and age, people are trying to make choices about what they do with their money and how they live. Trying to do justice. I don't think it's just white people. I think everybody's doing that. I think people that are taking this stuff seriously, that's what they're doing. That budgets and ballots are moral documents and we're living that way. We're moving from trying to change people of color to trying to change racism in ourselves. White folks at this stage may try to immerse themselves in communities of color. That might happen. White people at this stage are critical of themselves and others. That's probably true. If we were in a small group, here's what we'd talk about. What's the difference for you between being non-racist and anti-racist? That is a distinctive question. There are a lot of people that want to settle for being non-racist. Non-racist is not a thing. I have some other words that I'd probably use for what I would call non-racist. I will not include those in this lecture. <laughs> what lifestyle changes have you made to keep you on your anti-racism journey? What ones are you planning on making yet? What places of resistance do you still find in yourself that you want to work on? And what questions do you have that you need to, le to learn more about? What's your growth edge? If you were an institution where there's a lot of white folks at this stage, what would that be like? Hmm. Here'd be some questions I'd ask that leadership team. Besides a statement declaring that your agency has anti-racist values, what does your agency do to respond to racial injustice? So what do you do? And besides what's on your website, yeah, besides your, yeah, your land acknowledgement, that's the thing right now, right? Everybody has a land acknowledgement. Maybe even put it on a glass or a brass plaque in your lobby. It's good, but what do you do? What are you doing? What's the thing that you don't publicize so that you can get more money from donors? Because for me, like the real deal, I want to know what you're not telling your donors that you do just because it's right. And that you're not putting in a brochure. Because when you're putting it in a brochure, I feel like that's that thing where like, Jesus said, like, you already got your reward. You're just doing the same thing that everybody else is doing, which is just going after more cash. That's just pimping people. That's what that is. What are you doing? Because that's the morally just thing to do. And you don't care who sees it. You're doing it because it's right. Don't film it and photograph it. Just do it, because it makes a difference. Okay, so how are these results collected and measured? The things that you're doing to make a difference. Who in the agency is accountable, are you accountable to with these results? Who does it matter to and who are you reporting to? Are you accountable to someone outside of your organization? Or is all the information kept in house? Because if it's always kept in house, you're susceptible. What 
what areas in your agency, what areas in your agency uh, are you transparent about needing to improve on when it comes to racial inequality? Are you transparent about your work ons? The agency that's transparent about their work ons is really, really sincere. And the ones that keep it under wraps, there's image maintenance going on. We've got the final stage, autonomy. The last stage is reached when an individual has a clear understanding of and positive connection to their white racial identity while also actively pursuing social justice. Helm stages are as much about finding a positive racial identification with being white and becoming an active anti-racist. Another way of saying this, so a person here has internalized a positive white racial identity. They are actively anti-racist within their own sphere of influence. They have a development of racial identity that's not static. They continue to be open to new information and ongoing self-examination. So they don't think they've arrived, right? Like they've never reached the mountaintop. They're always open to new information. And that's what they see themselves on. Like the idea of like being a lifelong learner. It's humility. They're able to work effectively in multiracial settings, kind of like in that beloved community model. They have a conscious use of privilege and a willingness to take action. They value true diversity and difference, not just in skin color, but cultural styles, dialect, approaches to time, etc. They seek, so they're, they're seeking it out and accepting feedback from colleagues of color. They're asking for, where did I get it wrong? They're not saying, hey, if I mess up, let me know. That's not seeking it out. They're assuming that sometimes they're getting it wrong and asking, <laughs> I think I'm getting it wrong sometimes. Can you, can you talk to me about this? And they understand that racism is systemic and historically rooted. So if we're in a small group together, this would be what I'd talk about if you're at stage six. If I'm honest with myself, would other people of color describe me as being at the autonomy level? Because I think sometimes as white folks, we like to kind of imagine ourselves at the top of the heap. I know I do. I do. I like the idea that sometimes I get asked to talk about stuff like this. And when I think that probably means I'm at stage six, probably the truth is I'm not. Would other people of color describe me at being at the autonomy level? If so, can I describe where I was when I began my, my anti-racism journey as well as how I've continued to evolve and change up to this present moment? So can you talk about your story? Can you talk about where you were and where you're going, where you've been? If I'm not at the autonomy stage, where am I on my journey and where do I still want to grow? I think that's really actually the question. Like, even if you were, let's imagine that we're all at stage six, just for fun. You know, we're at a Christian school. Are any of us perfect? Like, for real, for real. Like, does sin ever stop affecting our lives? Because racism is sin, right? Like it is. Any of us stop sinning? Because I don't. Racism sin. I'm going to still sin. I could be at level six. I could still sin. Right? I'm going to still sin. I'm going to be an imperfect, sinful person who's still going to sin racially. I'm going to make racist sins. And I'm going to still do it even if I don't mean to. 
and I still want to work on it. And I want to work on it to my last day. I want to get better at this stuff, and I hope you want to get better at this stuff too. I hope our systems and institutions want to get better at this stuff. This would be stuff I'd ask them if we were at this last stage. And I'd, this is what I'd ask them. Is, is my agency comfortable talking about their evolution as an anti-racist institution? And this would be the, the hallmark, I would say. Are you comfortable as an institution talking about your mistakes? Is it public knowledge? If all you want to do is talk about where you got it right, is that honest? You know what's really cool about the Bible? You read the heroes of faith, you know all their crap. You know all the mistakes. All those heroes, you know how they messed up. You know about their affairs. You know about their kids that they had out of wedlock. You know about all the terrible stuff. You know about all the, the it's, frankly, it's unjust stuff. Horrible things. If that was happening now, man, that would be like front page news. It would be awful. These people would lose their jobs. There's no way. <laughs> I mean, Abraham, he sex traffics his wife. Really? I mean, David, David, it's like checking out naked women from the roof of the palace and he like marries her and kills his wife. That's, that's messed up. And then God says, like, you're a man after my own heart. Like, in spite of that. Because God forgives sin. And you really repented. And that's a pretty big one. Let's not pretend. That's big. That's not a little one. And it's not kind of like, like a little lie. Like it's mur like murder and all the... It's stuff like that all the way through the Bible. It's not just the men. We know a lot about the men. A lot of men. I mean, like I said at the beginning, I'm a, I'm an old, straight white guy. Like, I'm a therapist. A lot of people go to therapy because of straight white guys. So I, I mean, I know, I know, I know. They're telling me their stories. I'm like, yeah, I know, yeah, I hear you. I, I know. So. Institutions, we got to talk about our mistakes. If we are saying that the only story we can tell is us getting it perfect, is that squaring with scripture? I don't think so. That is not stage six stuff. That's stage one stuff. That's like colorblind stuff. That is not anti-racist stuff. That's a lie. We Christians should not be living in a lie. We need to be telling the truth. And the truth is, we make mistakes. We hurt people. We are trying to make it right. We are, this is our plan to go forward. This is what we're trying to do to not do that again. That is what an anti-racist institution would do. Here would be another question I would ask these people. What would it be like to work at a place that was secure in talking about its development, including the bruises and black eyes in this way? To talk about its own racial history. What would it be like to work at a place that did that? So to close, where do you think you are? What do you need to think about and do to get to the place that you want to be? Thank you very much.
And I've got time for a couple questions, and I know some of you probably want to go get something to eat, but I've got time for some questions from the audience. Yeah? Um, I was wondering if you could clarify the difference between the immersion state and the autonomy state. Um, I, know, I feel like they both seem to be like progressive journeys of awareness. Yes. And what would be the difference between getting to autonomy versus Okay, so let's go back. So I wish I was Janet Helms, who made the model, because I bet she would have something really nice to say about this. My thoughts, not being Janet Helms. I think that stage six is like heaven. Everybody wants to get to heaven. Stage five is like being on earth. So I'm trying to find the slide so I can pull this up. Oops. And I'm cycling back through here. Okay. This is the one I'm looking for right here. So this is walking on your own. In some ways, this is like you're doing it yourself for the first time. The next stage is like maintenance. You've been doing it not for the first time, but you've been doing it for a long time. And you are very comfortable staying there. And in some ways, it's like the journey continues and it's deepening, but there's also not any more identifiable things that you're doing differently that you can say like, wow, I'm moving from here to here to here to here to here. Now it's just getting richer. Kind of like if you ever have to cook things where like the longer it sits on the stove, like you're not adding more ingredients, but the spices are getting deeper and you're like, Ooh, curry is better if you wait 24 hours and now when you eat it, oh, it's good. <laughs> That's what I think it's like. Thank you. Yeah. Anybody else? Yes. Um, you talked about stage two and stage three being stage two more like emotional driven and stage three being more thinking driven. Are there are there, like, if you're in stage three and you have a lot of emotion, can you kind of go back and forth like that? It's not as, yes. would it be distinct? So this is a developmental theory mm -hmm. and lots of developmental theories. So you'll see this with all kinds of developmental theories where the idea of a developmental theory is that people do kind of, it's squishy. And people kind of shift back and forth between stages on their way. It's not like, one day you're in bucket three and then over into bucket <laughs> into bucket four you you do it's it's muddy so i'm sure when janet helms was developing this kind of like any theoretician you're collecting a lot of data and saying this is kind of the middle point of the data and it's here and these are the characteristics and here's the middle point of this other data and it's over here but it's it's all it's a continuum yeah. Um, thank you. I think it's also just in relationship to that, it's also important to point out that like times of stress in your life or in your situation can, you know, pop you back. Oh yeah. Regress, regression. So, but the hope is that if you've already gone through some of that developmental processing, that you won't stay in that place as long, or you'll recognize it, right? And be able to keep keep it moving. Mm -hmm. Do you guys know who's talking in the back here? You know why she's smart, right? <laughs> <laughs> this is this is Professor Stacia Huxma, my friend, who's also, when she's not a social work professor here at Calvin, is also an anti-racism educator in the community at large. So, yeah, good. I think there's time for another question, or maybe two. Yes. So you asked us at the end to think about what stage we might be in. Yeah. Is there research that shows how conflated we think 
yeah. like yeah. where we are, <laughs> like how many stages behind are you actually? Yeah. <laughs> what that looks like. Wow, that's a good question. Okay, so I was talking with um, an anti-racism educator last weekend. His name is John Williams. I mentioned him at the beginning. And he said it's really hard for white people at all to think about this at all. So my thoughts on that is if you are in the room at all, that's a good thing. On my journey, when I started the journey, I, I'm gonna be honest, I thought when I walked in the door I was at a five or six. And I was really confident, very confident, I was like, Probably a six, but maybe a five. <laughs> maybe. I was probably a two, maybe a one if I was having a bad day. Okay? But I couldn't see it. I couldn't see it. I had to get knocked off my horse a bunch of times. And I went through all these stages. I spent a lot of time crying. I don't cry here. <laughs> and I had some really um, generous mentors that poured a lot of time into me. I'm really grateful for that. But I was, I thought I was a five or a six and I was a one or a two. So I'm guessing that probably a lot of people are like that. I was, and I was just kind of like ugly snot tear reality when it hit me in the face. So, yeah. One more. One more. Yeah. Uh, thank you for what you shared. Just a quick question on that last note that you just shared. I couldn't see it. What recommendations, if any, could you share to help people how to see the see the light without feeling the lightning, without feeling the thunder, you know, without feeling the boom of it, but at the same time, cause them to open their eyes and see. Eric, can you recap the question for the audio yeah. capture? How do you see? How do you go from not seeing to see? Is that am I capturing it? Okay. Do you have a minute? I can share, because this is going to take more than one minute. Um, okay, I'm going, to be, I'm going to try to be brief, but I'm going to tell you a little of my story. Um, When I was a student here, um, I was a freshman, and it was a time like now, and there was right before the, the end of my freshman year, there were riots in Los Angeles. over a verdict, uh, Rodney, the Rodney King riots. Rodney King was a black man who had been beaten by the police. First time that that had ever been caught on civilian video. Back in the day when like a video camera was the size of a small suitcase that you'd carry on an airplane. So it wasn't like people just had them around, like somebody had it in their car and had to like do this and like park the lens through the window of their car to shoot the video. So it was like, that was like a, like a miracle that we even had the video. 
And people were like, I can't believe the police did that. All the white people. You know, and, and like here's but there's video evidence. Like, is this like a one-off? That's like what, what white people are saying. Like people of color are like, no. no. <laughs> And when the police went to trial and there was a not guilty verdict, there was a riot. And there were riots all over the United States afterwards. And I'm getting ready to take final exams. <laughs> we had prayer service at Calvin. We had a, it was very Calvin. We're gonna have a prayer service. There's these microphones in the chapel all set up. And we were supposed to go pray. It was like the last day of class, you know, and so like you walk in there. Calvin looked really different then. It was almost all white. Very few. I mean and I'm I mean this quite literally, like I think you could have literally counted on two hands the number of people of color who were and we're not clearly, I think if you, if you had four hands, maybe you could have counted all the international students too. Um, but nobody had four hands. So we just, you know, you used the hands you had. But it was a pretty white place. Three microphones and people were saying like they're very uh, nicely worded prayers. And then an African-American girl stood up and said, I can't wait to graduate so I can get away from all of you because I've been here four years and I haven't been able to have a single friend. And I'm like, oh, <laughs> I was like, oh, that, is that, that's not supposed to be said in chapel. Oh, it got really quiet. And kid that I knew stood up, white kid, stood up and said, I was one of the students in class and I never was your friend and I'm really sorry. And I knew that kid. He was a few years older than me. I knew him from my high school. And I'm like, I don't know what's going on here. I don't know why somebody would want to burn down their city. And I don't know why somebody wouldn't want to be her friend. I had thought about it the whole summer. My little white rural town with two stoplights. <laughs> and I sat there the whole summer, no social media. There's no social media. I just sat there and thought about it in my bedroom. And I came back to, to school the next year and I was like, who, who can I ask about this? And they just started this little thing, Office of Multicultural Student Development. So I walked in there. I'm like, I am not the person that this is for. But can I just ask? I've been thinking about this question for the whole summer. Like, I don't know what, to, I don't know who to ask. And I went in there every week for the next four years. And I got a mentor. And then she said, you need to get some other mentors. And I listened to her. So I got some other mentors. And I started reading and I made a lot of mistakes. I've said some super dumb stuff to my mentors, <laughs> really, really dumb stuff. And they confronted me. But I tried to listen. Cause I didn't understand, I knew I didn't know. I just, I knew I didn't know anything. It just really, it, 
shoot, I'm going to start crying. It just really... It bothered me to see people hurting and that I just didn't, I was oblivious. It just really bugged me. It's just, like how could I not know that? So I just, so I, it's still, there's still, I mean, I still don't, I still don't know enough. I don't understand enough. I have reactions every week that are not the reaction I want to have to things. My humanity is sinful and I feel it, but I'm working on it and that's, so, so that's the only thing I can say is like, that's how it was for me, is that something happened in the world. I saw how it hurt people and I wanted to understand. Sorry. Anyway, thank you all. You've been a, a wonderful audience.